I'm Rob Coleman. I'm a head of animation at Animal Logic in Sydney, Australia. And most recently, we did the Lego Movie. My role in the film as a head of animation was to mentor and support the existing team that was already at Animal Logic. They had been in development on the film for a, a year or so before I got there. And um, Zara Nelbandian, who runs uh, Animal, called up and said, I hear you might be leaving Australia. I'd love to show you a test that we've done for Warner Brothers for the Lego movie. So I went to the studio and, and had a look, and it blew me away. It, it was this amazingly funny screen test with a little pre-design of Emmett being coached by the real directors, uh, Christopher Miller and, and Phil Lord, who were throwing lines out at this little Lego minifig and him reacting as you would regularly see in a live action uh, rehearsal test or a screen test. But in this case, it was a little minifig. And the things that struck me right away were that they had stayed true to the nature of Lego, the, the little minifig, the little plastic, hard plastic, minifig. There was no bending in the elbows or the knees. Character was very expressive, face was very expressive, but it felt like the toy. And then it cuts to this amazing shot inside the screen test when this Emmett is transported onto a pirate ship and he's on this Lego ocean and there's Lego bricks spraying out and in this particular case surrounded by characters from Star Wars and, and I just like I have to move I have to work on this movie. Uh, they wanted me involved because they needed some uh, I call it gray-haired experience. Uh, I have been an animation director for a long time now, somewhere up close to 20 years. And, uh, and so they asked me to come in and, and help guide the team. So I was working closely with the co-director, animation supervisor, Chris McKay, working obviously with the production people, um, Amber Naismith, who was producing, and then uh, coaching and mentoring our leads. And, that, that, and that's vital because there's a lot of us who have been, you know, got into the business, we were talented animators, and we moved up through the ranks because we had a gift for animation and performance. And all of a sudden, at one point in your career, you're asked to be a, you go from a senior animator to a lead animator. And there's an enormous change in the res responsibilities that you have. You're now supervising a team, could be up to upwards of 10 people. You're being asked to schedule and bid the work, and you're asked to present the work to the client. These are skills that you may not have ever have had to, to use. And there's many animators that I've worked with over the years who have struggled. So a lot of my role was to help with that process, that nurturing and that mentoring to help our up and coming seniors who are now being leads and get them to work with uh, Phil Lord and Christopher Miller. I've been pretty lucky in my career being at the right place at the right time. I studied uh, hand-drawn traditional animation up in Montreal at Concordia University. Um, in the mid 80s and at that same time the the genesis of what would become Saftimage was being created in Montreal and in my hometown Alias was creating their amazing software and I didn't know it at the time but as a Canadian in the mid 80s I was introduced to both those packages and got to learn them I was a someone who would love an animation but was really interested in computers too and being there at the right time gave me a, a set of skills that allowed me to have the work at a level that when ILM released Jurassic Park in 1993, I immediately went back to the studio I was working at in Toronto, cut my reel, sent it down there, and fast forward, I ended up being hired as the ninth animator at ILM in would be October of 93. So suddenly I've gone from Toronto and now I'm working at ILM, which was beyond, wasn't even a dream I had. I mean, it was like, are you kidding me? I don't have the skills to be there. And very quickly, I was working on a number of small projects, um, and then uh, we were working on Dragonheart. And I was one of the animators on Dragonheart. Our supervising animator got, uh, became sick. I was moved up to cover for him, and suddenly I was supervising. I then moved on to uh, Men in Black, the first Men in Black, where I was the animation supervisor. I'm still animating. I, only had, I think I only had about 10 uh, animators working with me. I was still animating, and then that was a springboard. George Lucas had seen our work uh, on Men in Black, and then I, was, I had the opportunity to interview within ILM to be the animation supervisor on Star Wars Phantom Menace, which I got. And then uh, I, I, I guess I was able to uh, impress George well enough that I ended up being the animation director. He then gave me the title of animation director on 
Phantom Menace, Attack of the Clones, and Revenge of the Sith. Uh, those, those shows were massively bigger than what we had done on Men in Black. If, I, if memory serves, we had 200 shots on Men in Black, and it was 2,000 shots on Phantom Menace. And I remember we had weekly meetings at ILM with the supervisors, John Knoll and uh, the producer, Chrissy England, and it was on the first film. And it, the discussion, top, top line of the agenda every day was, can we get this movie done? And for about six months, the answer was, absolutely not. We cannot get it done. Uh, so I did. I spent a lot of time in, in a pressure cooker world of uh, working for the boss. In this case, we were working for George, producing the very best work we possibly could. Uh, I was running a team of 60 animators, um, but luckily the, the president of ILM at that time, Jim Morris, became an incredible mentor to me, took me under his wing. I had gone to him kind of probably with my hands waving in the air saying, you know, I need the support of, of you and senior management. If we're going to get this to work, I need to know that, you know, um, I have your support and that I'm getting all the coaching I can because... I'd seen individuals before me uh, be not so successful because they they didn't have the supervising skills. They didn't have, they were great animators. They were incredible animators, better than me. But what they lacked was any experience in the, on the, what I'll call the psychology side of what we do. We're dealing with creative people every single day. And yes, it's about the performance and about the animation. I spent a lot of time talking to the animators and coaching them and directing them and, and trying to get a, a cohesive performance out of multiple animators. But about half of my day is also dealing with the fragility of uh, how fragile people's uh, egos are. We've got people, you get every kind. You get, you get people who are huge egos and you got people who are very, very insecure. They're equally talented. Uh, you've got people that are animating beautifully for months and all of a sudden the muse just leaves them and suddenly they, they feel like can't animate anymore and they come wide-eyed to your office, terrified that they've lost it, that they, they can't do it. And so you're there as, as a coach and, and, uh, and someone to talk to, uh, maybe a little bit of a therapist sometimes, uh, but ultimately you know, you're working with really gifted people and as a supervising animator, that's a lot of your job is... I see it as, uh, I always use the analogy of like a big jigsaw puzzle. And if you imagine the corner pieces being, say, your lead animators and your seniors being the border of the jigsaw, then you're building the mids and juniors into the middle. And you're looking virtually at each piece and you're saying, okay, well, this individual's got a certain amount of skill creatively and technically. Who would they fit well with? And I kind of put pieces to a chat, maybe challenge a lead a little bit, or I'll pair up an up and coming mid with a really established senior. And in my mind, I think of this jigsaw puzzle, and I build the puzzle up. Um, and I guess I just naturally came to this philosophy, but it served me very well. And now I'm kind of teaching it or mentoring others to embrace that, that philosophy because I, the health of a team and, the, um, and their ability to work together and to inspire each other produces the best work. Early on, there was a brief from the directors that they wanted us to create a movie that looked like it was real Lego on a tabletop in someone's basement. And that was, um, that came out of uh, Lord and Miller's love of Lego, right from being kids to being adults and still playing with it. But that wasn't exactly the established look of animated Lego that had been done before. The Lego group out of Denmark has had digital Lego, animated Lego done, but they have uh, allowed the characters, their, you imagine the torso twisting or the arms bending at the, um, at the elbows or the knees bending. The toy can't actually do that, but because it can't do that, it's not very mobile. It can't, it's only got nine degrees of rotation and it, on the face of it, you can imagine it would be pretty hard to imagine that character coming to life. So I think the, the solution for, for others was, oh, we'll make the characters bendy. And, and that, in animation, we, you know, in traditional animation, we have, we have uh, squash and stretch and overlapping action and all, the, all those things that we use in animation, both hand-drawn and in computer animation. But Lord and Miller stayed very stiff or very strict about this and said, no, 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 no. To connect with your fans, Lego, with your, your beloved toy, worldwide beloved toy, we want 
our audience to believe that they're seeing their Lego pieces come to life. And we don't want Animal Logic to do any bending. We want, in fact, fingerprints and scratches and scuff marks on our Lego pieces. And it's my understanding that the Lego group was like, well, no, 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 we want it to look nice and clean. And they said, no, see, this is the thing. <clears throat> it may be clean and perfect when it comes out of the box. And you, we've all seen or experienced ourselves when you get the brand new box of Lego and you rip it open and you're immediately touching it. Well, it's starting to get dirty and it's starting to get scratched. And then if you take it outside, it's going to get bleached by the sun slightly. So our production designer, art director at Animal Logic, Grant Frackleton, spent a great deal of time studying real Lego under a magnifying glass and taking very uh, mac macro photography of the bricks in order to define what it was that we were seeing in the depth of field and the, and the, and the actual textures of the bricks. Um, and I know that there were those at Warner's probably and, and, and at Lego definitely who were concerned that this was maybe not the right way to go down. But when the first test started to come out, um, people started to say, well, this is actually looking pretty good. But the thing that we finally had to crack was the face because there was real concern that an audience would not engage and feel any empathy for our little hero character because he doesn't even have highlights in his eyes. He's got two little black dots and a little black swish for a mouth. And yet we wanted our audience to feel for him and to follow him on his adventure and love him and worry for him. And I'll be honest, even I was worried when I first got involved. I thought, oh, you know, we don't have much to play with there. But I'll tell you, even in the first week, we started seeing what the animators were doing and I actually get goosebumps thinking about it because suddenly, instantly, we were engaged with this little guy. We were believing that he was alive and thinking, which of course is the, the goal of any animator, is to breathe our own life, our own humanity into it, whatever we're animating it. In this case, a little tiny minifig. Uh, and that was, I remember seeing that in the theater and just going, and it was the nonverbal shots, actually. For me, it's always about cracking the nonverbal shots because we see it all the time in live action and of course we see it in real life. We, I say something and you're listening to me and, and you're nodding, engaging, or your eyes are darting around and I, we're communicating. So when you're animating, you wanna be doing that, giving to the other actor who may be talking so that there's engagement between your little actors. So for me, it was, do, can we sustain life in Emmett in his little face when he's not talking. And we did early on. And then I think they sh showed those tests to, to Warners and to the senior management at Lego and everyone, okay, all right. And now we believe that this can come to life and that this movie will sustain and okay, we're good, let's, let's go. There are many vital things that came out of our research of real Lego. Uh, we spent a bunch of time doing macro photography of real Lego assembled bricks uh, under various lighting conditions, and, and there's a couple things that we saw right away. One is, with real Lego bricks, there's a 0 .002 millimeter tolerance in the manufacturing of the bricks. Um, and anyone who's pushed bricks together, they don't, sometimes it's tough to squeeze them together. And you'll get this little uneven gaps. They're not perfectly lined up as the bricks are stacked one on top of the other. Um, Computer, gri computer gr bricks, however, are, are mathematically perfect and can sit perfectly, absolutely. And what we noticed was our bricks looked artificial because they were too perfect. So the team created a tool called Jitter. We called it Jitter. And what it did was it just jittered the bricks ever so slightly. We could do translation and rotational jitter, which created uneven gaps between our bricks. If you imagine a brick wall with the little gaps in between the bricks as they go up, uh, the artist had the ability to dial in the, the jitter and randomize the jitter, which was great for lighting because what it did was it just made the surfaces slightly uneven from each other. They weren't absolutely parallel or they weren't absolutely perpendicular. So that light would play off the bricks differently, which is what you see when you look at bricks, photograph bricks on a small, on a table with light on them. But what, you, what we didn't see when we initially started out with computer animation. Um, so that was a, that was a vital tool.